Welcome to this Photo Masters edition of the Ultimate Photo Guide Digital Photography Series, brought to you by Popular Photography and American Photo Magazines. These special edition DVDs take you on location with some of America's most acclaimed professional photographers. You'll see firsthand how their award-winning digital images are discovered, captured, and perfected to achieve stunning results. Grab your camera and get ready for this special Photo Masters edition of the Ultimate Photo Guide Digital Photography Series. Hi, I'm Tony Sweet. I've been photographing flowers for at least 15 years. They're very colorful, they're very graphic, and they're just uh, wonderful to photograph. The techniques that'll be covered begin from the basic compositions to finding a nice subject, making it look the way you see it, to more interpretive camera movement, soft focus, that type of thing. Cover the entire gamut of things that I like, the more creative types of flower photography. We're at Longwood Gardens, which is one of the premier gardens on the East Coast. It's just, uh, just a wonderful place to photograph. And there's several gardens, including the interior, that are just uh, limitless with possibilities. So I hope that these techniques will inspire you to get out there and uh, make your own great flower pictures. You know, one of the key principles of photography is to isolate and simplify your subject. So I tend to look for things that, that make that very easy. And I like for a, a colorful backgrounds also. These two elements are very important to me. In this particular situation right here, we have a flower sticking up, so it's isolated from the rest, and the background behind it is, is it's a very clean field. There's nothing in between, there's no visual noise. So what we want to maximize is the very soft pastel color and really good selective focus on the subject. Now there are two lenses that I would use to get that very romantic, very soft feel. The 105, which I have right here, is, is one choice. And the other one, I'll show you in a second, is a much longer lens. The 105, just to handhold and show you, I'm going to get this subject sharp and I want a very soft background. So that'll be, if I'm pretty much here, and I want to see, see the background behind the subject, and I want to get as close as I can, but fill the frame with, like don't clip the subject, kind of get full with it, you know. Get a full frame around the edges, and we're going to autofocus on part of it. There it is. Now the background's pretty good. I'll shoot this. As you can see, the, the shot with the 105 is, the background's okay, but it's patchy. It's a little too much detail for me. There's like a dark area in the top, and it's not, it doesn't have that real romantic soft palette that we like with flowers, or, or that I like with flowers. The way you get that is with a longer lens. In this case, I've got a 300 with a one, I'm sorry, with the um, extension tube, which allows me to focus very close to the subject, much narrower angle of view, and a much, more dramatic fall off of the sharpness. So you get a much more evenly pastel blended together color palette. So let's, uh, let's have a look. Always compose handheld first off the tripod to get a sense of what you want to do. And I want to see the color behind that flower basically. And I want to fill the frame as much as possible with the subject. And the good thing about the long lenses is that you can get back quite a bit further which gives you a much softer background on top of that. So that's the magnification right there. And a little more height, which I have right here. And this should actually, this, this should be good right here. I got a lot of pink behind uh, the subject. Vertical format because it is a vertical format subject, as you can see. And I think we're pretty close to where we want to be right here. Everything's pink, it's pastel. Need a little more room for the subject. So you're always moving back and forth, always adjusting. I don't want to compose too tightly. There we go. What if I go over here? There's our pink, there, there it is, there it is. Don't be afraid to move around. It's very, very small moves. Right there. And our subject fills the frame perfectly. Very tightly composed, pastel background. And what's our depth of field going to be? It's going to be wide open because we want the fall off to be immediate behind the subject. 
So we're gonna shoot wide open. If we shoot too stop down, there's too much detail in the background, you don't want that. So very selective focus, right in the front flower. And it'll be sharp enough. But again, it's very finely tuned. Macro work is, is, is uh, difficult. It's trying, physically trying. And you need some patience, which I need more of, but I'm getting better at it. Okay, right there, there's our background. We're saying about a stopover on aperture priority. And our shutter speed is fast enough that we should be able to do that handheld. So we'll focus in here and then we will take our shot and have a look. So we shot the previous shot at plus one, which is a little overexposed in the bright highlights. So I'm gonna pull it back one more third of a stop and focus on a foreground pedal and just shoot that without a cable release because it's fine. Histogram says that we're just a little hot. Let's pull it back one more third of a stop. Very small increments. These can be adjusted in software, by the way. These kind of small exposure variations are easy to correct. I just like getting it right when I shoot it. Right there. And that's exactly right. Detailed everywhere, good pink background. Let me uh, try one more thing, because I like getting this thing exactly right. Take it down a notch. See if you can get a little more pink in the background. The whole key is to get as much background color, soft pastel as we can. That's, that's, that's the key to this, the goal to this, this kind of shot. There we go. A little more pink at the bottom, which I like. Everything's out of focus, except for the subject. Very selective focus, there it is, and we're plus a third. Very fast shutter speed, 1 400th, which is actually fine for this subject. Let me get a bit higher now, because I got a little too much dark area up top. Again, you're constantly fine-tuning these, these compositions. Now I've got pink a little more. Yep, you're always trading off. This is good. Let me take one of these. What we're going to do is shoot a bunch of these and keep the one we like the best. You just want to work your subject. That's good. And let me see. Let me make sure I got what I want. See this? Let's try one more. It's always a good idea to overshoot your subject. Shoot it a lot of times because you may find something you like better than what you think you like. And we'll do that. And that's the most pink. And that's the one that I like the best. Just make sure, do one more. This kind of persistence is uh, what it's about here, folks. You just keep shooting till you get it right, then you keep shooting again till it gets better. And get a little bit sharp. We have pink everywhere, very soft background, shot wide open. There's our shot. And that's exactly what I had in mind. Sharp subject, very shallow depth of field, a lot of color, seamless background. That's the way you get that. Macro photography slash close-up photography is, is, is uh, very challenging. You can do a lot of like close-up shots of things, but true macro is like really inside of a subject, at least to me it is. And it's a, a lot more work than doing just a close-up of a flower. You're actually working to find a really small patch of great detail and getting to it is, is difficult. In this case, this is a great patch of, of, of material because it is in a recessed area where there's not wind, the wind's passing over us. Consequently, this, is, this subject is very still and uh, we will need a fairly long exposure, in my experience, four, five, six seconds. So any movement will uh, um, make it a waste, wasted effort. So let, let's um, find a patch of this that makes sense to me. And this is low to the ground. There's a whole lot of depth between the green and what's under it, you want to get things that are sort of on the same plane because your depth of field in true macro photography, even at F32, is a matter of maybe a quarter inch, three-eighths of an inch at the most, depending on your distance from your subject. But, uh, but true macro uh, really limits a, a depth of field at a very high aperture. 
So I'm trying to find things that are kind of on the same plane, so it'll be sharp edge to edge. I may find that, I may not, but I'm gonna have a look at it. I think I see a patch right here that's on this, this kind of plane, where if I get in there and the camera is on the same physical plane as the subject, at F32, it should be razor sharp edge to edge, or as much as is humanly possible. So we're, so we're gonna try to get in there, and it is not easy. Tripod technique is, is critical. I'm gonna pull this down a bit. It gives you an idea of uh, what we're talking about. Try not to kill your subject. <laughs> Flowers are, are adorable, but, but try to be um, very careful. We want to shoot this patch right in here. So we got to be on this kind of angle. So we're going to work this. Got to get quite a bit lower. So we'll pull that out and try not to hurt anything. Okay, it's getting there. And a little lower here. The tripod positions are, are, are often um, pretty comical because everything's sticking out every which way just to get you right in where you need to be to get the shot here. Let me see if I'm getting what I want. Okay, not bad. Do a little house cleaning here. Pull that out of there. Cover that hole up a little bit. It's okay to schmooze things around as long as you don't hurt anything. And let's get right up in here. We want to fill the frame with this sea urchin type stuff. It's amazing. And I can get a whole lot closer, so I'm going to try to get down a little bit tighter as much as possible with no green, no black holes. And using the preview button, depth of field preview button is critical for macro photography. You've got to see what you're going to get. So when I press this preview button, it gets very dark because the shutter is going down to f32 in this case. But if you let your eyes adjust for a second or two, you'll be able to see how sharp and where the image is sharp. That's why I'm covering my head up here so I can see it. And back out a little bit. And right about in here. I'm gonna fire one off. It's about, uh, I'm, fo I'm focusing in one third from the very front, like hyperfocal is in landscape photography. These are many landscapes. And hyperfocal in landscape photography is one third into the pictures, basically. That's what this is. One third past the first part of that subject, I'm focusing in a little bit. So I get one third in front of my point of focus sharp and two thirds behind it. And that's what I'm gonna to try to do here. So we're filling that up and we're saying that we're about eight seconds. Close the window here and 1001. Three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. It also takes eight seconds to write. So we have to wait for that and see what we get. It looks pretty good. We bring it up a little bit. That's pretty sharp. Histogram says that I'm a little bit blue. It's a very blue scene. Now, what I would normally do is adjust my white balance in raw, but it's so blue that I want to see it look somewhat natural. So I'll put changes to shade white balance because it is so blue in here. I'll take one more shot and have a look at it a little warmer as I'll see it later when I process it. And hopefully it'll be full frame, just razor sharp, no holes, no green stuff sticking in. And let's see what we get here. Took the shot, it's writing. Okay, not bad, it's good balance. I got um, the dark edges are balanced, there's three of those. I'm magnifying this tremendously and it is absolutely sharp on this edge, over here, wow. Yeah, yeah, the key is to get on the same visual plane as your subject. And that's what I did here. And the only thing that I'm a little concerned with, not a, not a deal breaker, if I can maybe just move a little bit over to cover that hole up. There we go. We're gonna do one more and this should do it. Got a little black hole that I'm not too crazy about. But this, uh, this should do it. Again, we're looking at uh, Right now we're at uh, eight seconds still at f45. Want this razor sharp, long exposure. And we'll see what happens. As you can see, macro is very strenuous. 
uh, and macro photography is it's not for sissies it, it's, it's pretty serious stuff just kidding okay and we're writing right now and we're pretty much there okay razor sharp all the way throughout now if worse comes to worse I can clone a little bit in that black area no problem in digital land which I'll probably do but what I'll wind up with is a completely full frame edge to edge with this, these little purple spiky beautiful little little sea urchin type subjects here. These, these are things you would walk by probably uh, almost 10 times out of 10. But if you're looking for macro photography, you're looking for macro subjects, uh, highly detailed, very graphic uh, is what I look for. And, and this, uh, this fits the bill pretty well. That's the idea. Yeah, I saw this dragonfly just hanging out on that, uh, that water lily bud and he kept just coming back and forth, returning like most birds do, come back to the same spot every time. And they're flying back and forth. Dragonflies are running around like crazy right now, so we're going to try to um, get some shots of them on different uh, situations. On this one, the background flower, the color is a great background, shooting at, at the, uh, a little wider aperture. I want to shoot about f11 to get some detail in the background. But the color is just uh, tremendous. The wings are very tobacco colored on this one, which is very unusual. And adds a, a nice color palette to the, uh, of the overall scene. We have a uh, 300 with a 1.7 teleconverter. And I'm roughly about uh, eight inches off the ground. Because it's always a good idea to get, uh, to get eye level with your subject. And I'm firing off a bunch of them at F18 because I want to bring in some background detail on the flower. But um, with a uh, 300 with a 1.7 teleconverter, I'm pretty much right up in there. I'm going to shoot a handful of them, kind of get them off center a little bit, get more color in there if I can. And I'm manually focusing because it's, uh, it can't quite find the edge of this guy. He's moving around a whole lot. But it's a pretty fun subject, and they normally don't sit there that long at all. Yeah, that's the idea. This is the iPhone 4. There are many cell phones you can use for photography. They all have cameras. They're getting better all the time. The 4 shoots a 5 megapixel file, which is larger than the Nikon D1 shot, I believe, when it first came out. And you can also do stitching and, and panning and, and use all kind of apps to create these really far out images that are printable. You can put them up online, on your blog, on your Facebook page, you can, you can tweet them, uh, whatever. The most frequently uploaded image to Flickr is shot with an iPhone. So it's getting really good. And we have a great situation here. I always use this for quick grab shots like this and the, uh, the, the, uh, the app for stitching, which is like great. So you can shoot a series, which we'll do here, and then we'll put them together in software, and they're large enough to print. I mean, not like gallery size, but you know, 13 by 19, five by 20, like a nice small pan here. So let's uh, get this together, and let's pick out our camera. And here we go. We're gonna shoot horizontal format. I'm gonna practice first. So I wanna pretty much start here and move the camera off axis like that if we can, to get things the sharpest. So I'll start about here, right about there, and we'll take one, and then schmooze in this way a bit, and then one more this way, and then one more to get that little edge right there. So that's four shots. And we will bring those up. I'm gonna use an app stitching app called Auto Stitch. There are many apps that will stitch your pan images together. On this one, I'll go into here and I will select the four images that I just shot from my camera roll. You just select one, two, three, four. It puts them together in a little box down here. One, two, three, they're down here. And then you hit stitch and then it'll put them together. And then you can crop the way that you like and get your final stitched image. It does not take long, it's doing it right now. It's a matter of maybe like, you know, 30 seconds or so. It's, it's amazingly fast. These apps are unbelievable. All right, so we hit crop, 
and it crops for you. I want to pull it back a little bit right down to here and I'll say crop and look at it long ways and there is, that's our final shot. Okay, what I'm seeing here since the sun's getting brighter is um, very strong backlighting. And since the flowers have been watered, that gives us the, um, the uh, possibility of having really nice blown out specular highlights. There's real nice soft orbs, you know, around uh, like out of focus dew drops, that kind of thing. But they are very tricky from this distance. And I can't get too much closer being in a, uh, a conservatory, so to speak, or a, a privately owned garden. So you gotta be, uh, you gotta work within your means here. Let's try a tripod on this. It's getting tougher to hold the, to hold the lens still. Have a little more control this way. There we go. Now, if I just want to shoot highlights, okay, there's a dew drop. Yeah, there we go. Let's try to change formats here. I think I think we're on to something. Okay, this is exactly what I'm looking for. It's kind of abstract, but I'm going to focus on the uh, the frontmost dew drop at average tonality. No cable release, but it is one five hundredth of a second. That's not bad. Histogram says that it's blown out, which it is, because the dew drops are very bright. So they will be blown out. So I wouldn't worry about that, as long as the effect is good, which it appears to be here. Let me see. Picture of dew drops, out of focus dew drops. Now if I can find some color, that would be really, really nice. Try to add some pink in there somewhere. Now these don't even need to be sharp. These, these can be totally out of focus with nothing sharp at all, since it is a picture of uh, just color and abstractions. Yeah, just out of focus dew drops. That's what we're talking about here. See if we can find one. And you also see, you see little rainbows because it's so strongly backlit. Some of the dew drops pick, pick up the uh, rainbow spectrum. And the problem is getting that in a composition that works. Let's just try that one real quick. And again, the exposure is fast enough where you don't really need a tripod for support. You need it so you, your arms don't get tired, basically. Let's try this right here. I'd like to get a strong composition, but it's tough. It's a very busy scene. Yeah, so you just focus like this, back and forth through the scene and see what you get. Doesn't need to be sharp. Um, yeah, the vertical shot's pretty nice right there, right in that area, right there. That's the greatest concentration of, uh, of the dew drops that I see. It's just kind of a fun shot, something we don't see every day. I get the very top one sharp, and again, you don't need a cable release because the exposure is so, so quick on this. Underexposed it a bit, and that's the basic idea. Let me see if I can find one more. I'm still not totally thrilled. I like what I have, but I have something else in mind. Now, a lot of times, you're not going to get what you have in mind. That's just the way things are. But um, let me see. Just focusing in and out, just seeing what shows up. Something looks promising, just take your shot. It is sitting bad right here. Let me change formats, vertical format. And this does have a uh, release on top, which is good. And we're in here. Little more, just uh, these are completely visual abstracts, as you'll see, just color abstracts. Just focusing in and out, seeing what you get. These are pictures of out of focus dew drops. I know it sounds crazy, but these also make great backgrounds for uh, for textured overlays. What is that? What we're going to show you? Pretty cool stuff. Yeah, it's fine. That's fine. So that's the idea. Backlit dew drops are great. If you go to a garden where it's like they're watering and you get in early like this, 
uh, that's what I look for right away because it's very exciting. And again, we're a little bit back far from the subject. If I could get right on top of that, I'd get a 105. But since I can't, I'm okay with this. No problem at all. Yeah, we have uh, some great light this morning at this small pack of Rudbeckia, which are really, um, really beautiful and graphic flowers. And they aren't chewed up yet, so they look really good. I'm gonna to try to find a, uh, a really nice pattern, good flower, some dew drops maybe if we're lucky. And I got the 105 out here, because I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get close to the subject proximity wise. I want the lens about here, so I can fill the frame with the subject. And I'll start with a 105 straight shot, then I might try a, a multiple exposure or a lens baby. Just, it's always a good idea to work the subject with more than one shot, you know. So I'm gonna start with a straight, uh, straight 105 image. So we'll find the right shot, some nice graphic, uh, graphic stuff here. Yeah, these lines that are really open right now are kind of nice. A couple little dew drops, nice green background. And we can stop that down and the light's really good right now. So we're gonna pop this on, on our tripod, which is always a good idea. It's actually essential with flower photography. And let me get the right height. You need a good tripod for any kind of consistently good photography. It gives you a chance to study your composition, to make very fine-tuned adjustments. And you can also spread these out a bit. You don't need to go to the next notch. Like here, you can just pull it open slightly to adjust your height. You don't need to move to the next, the next complete notch because it'll stay pretty much where you put it. And I want to get on the same plane as the subject. And I'm right up in there, a little tight for me. So I'll just back it up a notch, bring this back in. And you want to get the, um, for maximum sharpness now, you want to have the lens on the same plane as the subject. That way you can shoot wide open if you need to, and get sharpness throughout edge to edge. A little bit lower. I want to fill the frame a little more with the subject here. And again, this is the process. You, you start, and then you just start moving around. See, what I'm doing here is, I, is I'm going to clip all three sides of the subject and have the one side more open. Now, you have a lot of depth in a subject like this from the very top of the the flower to the, the petals, it's a lot in, in macro land. So you need to stop down to get this sharp. So what you want to do in this case, um, it, it, it's, it, it's really tricky to get a, a round subject in a rectangular space. So you have to find ways to make it work. One way is to chop off three sides of it and have the one side point into the picture space. So you have like three sides that are chopped off, not clipped, you want to chop the subject off dramatically. And then have the one, uh, the other side a little more open. Checking the uh, depth of field, and I'm at f22, but the greens are far, far enough away that I can get the color, but not that much sharpness back there. So it gives a very soft pastel background. And I should be at f22 here, and I'm saying aperture at about plus two thirds. And always use mirror lockup and close your window in your finder, or else sun will get in there and underexpose your image. So there's, there's the mirror lock, and there's the exposure. And I think that we look pretty good. We're a little bit hot, I like this. It's always better to slightly overexpose than underexpose. So I'll dial this back to about minus one third, and we'll hit this, mirror lock up. One more shot, there we go. Have a look at that, and that's pretty much, histogram says we are perfect. And I can uh, do stuff here in software. But that's the basic idea on this uh, particular shot. And the sun's getting kind of hot. We're going to move on to the next scene. But this is a, that's a done deal. Oh, you know what? Let me try one more thing since, since we're here. Uh, it's always good doing more than one shot of, of, of a particular subject. So we're going to pull the camera off of here. And we're going to set up multiple exposures. We can, you can do it in software or um, in camera, which Nikon's allow you to do, and pretty much multiple exposure, 
I'm saying, yep, I'm going to shoot 10. And let's go to uh, ISO 4. And we're looking good. Make sure here. It's easy to get lost on these multiple exposure things. Here we go. And now we'll just shoot 10 while moving the camera around in a circle. And I do want autofocus on here because I want to focus on the very tip each time. So now we're going to say right there, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Each time the focusing spot was placed in the center of the flower. And that's, that's it for that. But you know what? This is good. A lens baby is a phenomenal flower lens great flower lens so we'll put this back in here real quick most important thing is cover that <laughs> but I keep on my lens cap there it is right there now let's find our next uh, next lens which I believe is somewhere around here here we go lens baby lens baby is a great flower lens and we'll do that and very quickly replace stuff there we go and we're at 2.8 aperture, which is perfect. And now let's uh, pull the kibble release off. We're gonna hand hold this and just find a, a different angle. How about down here? Let me see. Right about, if I'm in here, there we go. That's not bad right there. And you can bend the lens, move it around to get selective focus. That's good right about there. We also have close-up diopters for this, which I will use next time. We'll say plus one on this. And just, uh, just fire that off. That's pretty much it. Let's try one more. What if I get up here and focus through that? Let me see. No, I think we're pretty good right about here. It's not too shabby. And we'll just fire off this one, get good edge blur here, and select the focus is good. And the ISO is ISO 400, which uh, depending on the camera that you have, the ISOs in the uh, later cameras are pretty phenomenal. You can shoot this one, the D3S for example, at uh, ISO 800. And for everything except HDR, it is pretty great. So another great cell phone shot. This subject here is just tremendous. Look at all the texture and the color and it's like really big so it can fit full frame in uh, the uh, cell phone camera. So I'm going to grab my camera app and get right up in here and get right inside of it. So I want to get the color, the texture right up in here. There we go. There we go. Getting a nice rhythm, nice flowing lines right up in here. Sharpen that up. There it is. There we go. Now we're going to look at it with an app that's called Camera Bag. Very cool. So back to my uh, my photos. Back into Camera Bag. Let me see here. There we go. Into Camera Bag. And there's the original. And we're going to flick right through it. You see all the different variations, it's very far out. It just creates all these different variations right away. And it's just very beautiful. Look at that, different color spectrum. These are great presets. And the other great thing about this app is that it saves a very large file, like 25, 60 on the long side. Very large for printing. You can print these, very large JPEGs. But the, um, look at the variations, just beautiful much more softer, more like a Kodachrome kind of look. Much darker here. The infrared, I mean, it's just like, it just gives you this, uh, this fish eye, just tremendous. It's a circle for you, like a lens baby fish eye. And there's the original. It gives you just numerous possibilities from one app that you can just scroll through and you get a super large file size you can print. 
So it's uh, just great fun and, and, and just tremendous. I noticed this really great looking flower here with very large dew drops and it's like really a great subject. The sun's kind of bright, hitting it right on right now, which is not the best, the most flattering light for flowers. So we're going to use a diffusion disc to hold back the harsh light and create sort of a glow, a yeah, cloudy day, very diffused glow kind of a look that you'll see here. Um, so let's, um, let's check it out. First of all, always compose off tripod. So you, you feel not limited by the tripod's height or whatever. So I'm gonna hand hold the camera and get my composition and then I'll move things into position. And what I wanna get is full frame of the inside of the flower, nothing on the edges, just completely full of flower and stamen and dew drops. None of the edges, nothing. Now my shadow can diffuse that to an extent, but the quality of light is not as nice as a diffusion disc, which we're gonna set up right now. And I believe I was a little bit closer in here. Now again, you can actually, let me get up here and pull this down just a notch. Be careful not to kill anything. And I believe we're right around here. Nope, a little further back. The 105 is a very powerful lens. And again, you're gonna constantly adjust and readjust macro compositions. That's the uh, name of the game here. And I believe we're somewhere around here. Okay, so at this point, I'm trying to get a good composition. What I want is just all leaf, all dew drops, and stamen. No edges, no bright light, which you see here is occurring. And we'll deal with that soon. Uh, but the composition is a full frame composition with the pristine stamen, a lot of dew drops, very, uh, very high key, very strong graphic. Now for focusing in, in macro land, I'll stop down to F32 here, which is, uh, which you would need to get things as sharp as possible. Now the point is where you focus. I tend to want to focus one third from the bottom of the frame, just like in landscape, maybe a little further in, right about there. And that appears to be, everything appears to be razor sharp. My exposure here is basically aperture, oh, autofocus off. Because for autofocus to work, it's got to find an edge. And it cannot find an edge on a white sheet of paper, basically. And fine tune this just slightly right there. In macro land, fine tuning by a matter of a quarter of an inch can make, uh, make all the difference. And we'll focus about one third from the bottom. And I'm on aperture, so I'll say plus, plus one on this. And there's our bright spot. This is our diffusion disc, which we're gonna hold as close as possible to the subject. This gives you a shadow, but as you move in closer, if you can look very carefully, you'll see it start to get this kind of a glow to it. And the closer you get to it, the more you get that real beautiful kind of glow to the subject. And since we're inside there, we don't need to block off the edges. I want to avoid touching anything. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's right on the money. All right, so now we're gonna add one more element to the mix here. After using a diffusion disc, more times than not, you're gonna to need to use a reflector to push, to grab the sun and push some light back onto the subject. Give it, give it some depth. That's why we, we got a cable release. So we're gonna diffuse the light here and then hold it with a cable release hand and throw some light back in. We're gonna grab the sun, there it is. Got to get the right angle, and then we'll throw some sunlight back, there it is, into the subject, not a lot, just enough to brighten it up. Let's try this. That's, that's good, right? Always take more than one, because things are always moving. Just a little extra light, see it? Before, after, kind of gives you a glow in that center part. You just got to find a way to make it work. What I was trying to do was to, to spotlight with this reflector the center of the stamen there, the stamen, because it, there's sort of a warm cast there already, kind of a light amber. And this, the gold side of that, will, will bring that out a bit. So more times than not, you will use these two devices together. Hi, 
Hibiscus like this are notoriously difficult to photograph. People want to shoot straight down into them and you're never going to get them all sharp. It's not going to happen. Too much depth of field, you're too close. You can't achieve it in one exposure. So the option that I like is there's a whole lot of color. There's like a, a reddish cap and it's like yellow and like pastel red and pink all in there. And shooting wide open, what happens is you get more of, of, of the color blending, you know. Uh, plus the wind's blowing a little bit, plus the fact that it, it, it's kind of chewed up anyway. So um, with the D3S, which is very good at very high ISOs, I'm able to shoot at, at F8 at ISO 800. So I get a, a, you know, more sharpness than shooting wide open, but I still get that very abstract you know, color effect. So let's get it while it's kind of st standing still. I'm at absolute one-to-one uh, -one magnification. And I'll just fire a bunch of these off. And I'm sure I'll keep at least one. Kind of a human zoom. See, what I'm trying to avoid is that there's a very dark red patch at the bottom of the stamen, which looks just a big, it's just, what comes out on the camera is just a big black hole. So I'm trying to shoot into the brighter red so it has more, more color fidelity and not that great big dark black area, which appears to be black when you shoot the picture. And you want to shoot a bunch of them because it is moving and um, you can't use autofocus because it, it, it can't find an edge. Flower is always moving around a bit. So I'm going to get in here one to one at the highest magnification and I'll just fire a few off. Let me try autofocus because you never know. It is kind of still. Yeah, it can't quite, can't quite find it. All right, let's take it off. And we'll get right up on that. Wide open. There we go. Back off a little bit. Now it's moving. I'm going to wait a second. It's going like crazy for a few seconds. Just got to wait it out. No big deal. Okay. And I'm shooting into the nice pastel, pastel pink. That's a good one. Kind of a human zoom. You zoom in, you zoom out. Have that right in here. Most people think that you need to have a razor sharp image macro shot to be a very acceptable macro image, very sharp. Uh, but if the wind's moving your subject, uh, it makes it impossible to get that. So you can do one of several things. You can actually shoot faster exposures, higher ISO, or a longer exposure and capture the movement, shallow depth of field to get more of an abstract of a color type of look, it's up to you. But the varieties of what you can do during adverse conditions are, are pretty much unlimited. One of the main challenges in shooting wide open, when you can't use autofocus especially, is that you're focusing by hand or by moving in physically. If you're able to use autofocus shooting wide open, I suggest you do it because if you miss at all, the shot's not gonna work. You need something sharp somewhere in most images. Uh, in this case, I've got a hand the camera and I can't use autofocus. So the only way around it is just to shoot a bunch of them, just to shoot a lot, move in and out, just stay with your subject, and watch out for your back, of course. And, and that's how you get one or two shots that'll work for you. None of them will be razor sharp because of the flower moving around all the time. But if one or two of those red stamen are sharp, then you got a winner. Another great app is for creating HDR images. Believe it or not, you can actually shoot one image that exposes for the highlights and one that exposes for the shadows, and then it combines both of these images to give you a true HDR shot. Let's take one. It says here to tap somewhere bright. This is the highest, the brightest exposure. The screen gets dark, brings in the highlights, and you say take picture one. And then it says tap somewhere dark. So I find the darkest part of the image opens the shadows up, and I say take picture two. And now two pictures come up, and it's merging them together to create a true HDR shot. And it's amazing. Doesn't take long. And here it comes. Not bad, see detail everywhere. And you also have the added controls of brightness, contrast, saturation, warmth, etc. So you can further adjust the image get it exactly the way that you like it. A little warmer, and we'll save it. And that's pretty much cell phone HDR.
I'm gonna show you a technique called shooting through. It, it's not really obvious. You've gotta look for it a little bit. What I'm talking about is you want a very soft, soft ball of color in the foreground that you focus through past that to a distant subject. So you get a very soft foreground, like soft ball of color. And the way you get that is with a long lens primarily. In this case, a 300 millimeter fixed lens. You can use a 400, 200, depending on the distance involved. And I'll tell you that in a second. Uh, the way we get started, grab the camera and always compose off tripod. And what I'm looking at is that flower shot through this little hole right here. So I will pick up this out of focus red, like a nice softball, and the flower back there will be sharp with a nice green, soft green background. So it really gives you a, just a really nice color palette. And we'll just have a look at it. Shoot through here and we're gonna focus on the distant subject. And this is, uh, that's good right there. So we approximate where we want the, the camera to be, right about here. I can remember that. Then move the tripod up, be careful not to hurt anything. Very gentle, even in mulch. I want to be right about almost. Let me have a look. Okay, this, this, this gives me what I'm looking for. I have red framed in red with a nice green, um, soft green background behind it. And I am shooting on autofocus because I'm shooting wide open. And it's possible to miss focus. If you miss by a hair, you miss the shot. So I am on autofocus and it just pops it right in right there and you'll find that autofocus at times has a hard time finding an edge when you're shooting through something there it is so you got to keep moving that little rectangle around to where you want to focus and now we're good and i'm saying this is an average tonality shot plus a third so slightly brighter than average and i'm not using a cable release because it's a very fast shutter speed and we'll just take this shot here. Right. Okay. Nice pastel. Nice surrounding. The, the, the soft out of focus red surrounds the subject. Noticeably sharp through the little colorful hole there. Let me back up a little bit and try it again. It's always good to uh, try different compositions. And I'll try this on manual focus because it is uh, really in a colorful haze back there. Here we go. And we'll just focus this as good as we can. And take this shot. Let's have a look at it. And it's always good to try different formats. In this case, the, the stem goes right in between those two flowers here. So it's, it's a very nice vertical composition. I may need to realign myself just slightly. But again, whenever you can shoot the same subject in horizontal and vertical formats is always a good idea to do that because you never know when you're going to need a horizontal or a vertical for a client or for a card composition or your own personal use okay let's uh move around here a little bit just a shade okay now we're in nice reds nice green center of that flower is razor sharp and we're gonna fire that off that's the idea let's try one more it's important also to realize that these subjects can be a little bit too dense you want to get the most translucent part of the subject so if it lo looks like a little bit too red or too dense where you can't see through it, you want to try to work around that and i'm trying to do that now it's got a little a little bit too dense for me right there so i need to either get closer which I'm going to try right now. When you get closer, it diffuses the, the density, makes it a little more thin. And now we'll focus. Now this works much better, much better composition. There we go. There we go. That's the idea. Let's take it down a notch. Have that right up in here. Get a little more of the green at the bottom. Always shoot more than one shot. Now we have a little more green. The important thing is the center of the flower is sharp. Everything around is very soft, very pastel, and that's how you achieve the very sharp subject and a very soft ball color surrounding it.
This is a um, really great flower patch for a technique, uh, for mold exposure technique called, you know, what I call the zoom swirl. Sounds like an ice cream thing, but it's actually a technique. And uh, it's done specifically in this case with a, uh, a zoom lens with a tripod collar right here. So when you do this, the entire camera mechanism turns. For this example, I'll show you. So I'm going to shoot 10. So I'm setting it up on an icon at minus three, and then I'm picking multiple exposure, auto gain off, and then single photo on a D3S. And then we'll start at 70, and we'll start about over this way, and then we'll do 10. One, two, three, four, four five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10. Now, what we're going to get is a, a spiral, like a, a, a hurricane type spiral out of the middle. You yeah, normally focus things, putting something in the center of the frame is kind of, it's, it's very static. And you avoid that nine times out of 10, but not always. It's exceptions to every rule. And this is one of them because you're going to use autofocus on this. And what's important, let me do one more, is that we start at 70 on this lens. And then I've got my multiple exposure set up here. So we're on, and then we're going to start at 70, and then we just autofocus on one spot, shoot, zoom, turn, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's easy to run out of space. Sometimes say I, I, I'm at like nine, and, I, and uh, this is over. I'm, I'm kind of at the end. Just, you just move back one. It's not like it's rocket science. You can have a little overlap. You can move back if you run out of space, whatever. But if you do it enough, you get a feel for it. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, And that's the end of it. And you come right to the very end. That way you use every exposure. But if you wind up short, just move it back one. It doesn't much matter. So that's out of the middle again. And again, it's, 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 it's a very, very nice uh, a spiral pattern. Now the other technique, which will use a, a wider lens, and hand hold it because this technique pulls the uh, zoom out of the middle, out of the center of the frame. On this one, you can have the zoom emanate from one of the corners. So this is, this is uh, easier done handheld, by the way. So we're going to basically start, we're going to find our composition, right about here is good, and we're going to move our autofocus rectangle to the bottom right corner, so it's in the bottom third of the frame basically. And then we'll set our multiple exposures up, which I think we are right now. Okay, we're good. So we have, we, have, is the, we get the whole swirl pattern with this flower as our focal point. I'm focusing right there as I turn the camera. Each time I'm putting an autofocus rectangle right, right there, right there. So that's, that's the center hub of this, uh, of this wheel, so to speak. And then I'll shoot 10, but I'm going to have the, the autofocus occur in the bottom left-hand corner of the frame. You get more of a, uh, that swirl from the bottom corner rather than from the middle. So we'll start here off to the side, turn the camera slightly, and we'll say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Got right to the edge. Excellent. So the zoom comes out of the corner rather than from the middle. It's another way to do it. This works best with a wider angle zoom um, and hand holding. So you may need to push the ISO up, even go to F11, even wide open. Doesn't matter what your ref stop is, depending on what you want to do. I'm F22 to get a razor, very sharp edges, but you could use F16, F11, F8, even wide open sometimes. Depends on what you like. But those are your two basic zoom swirl techniques. I really enjoyed long shutter speeds and moving the camera over color, like a color swipe, we call them, you know? And luckily there's an app for that, believe it or not. I'm gonna show you right here. The light is so blue right now that that's gonna look very blue. The red, the green, the yellows here. It's a great color palette and it's kind of cool light. 
So I'm gonna just get a composition here and move the camera. There it is, look at that, all that color. Just tremendous. And then we'll hit this, and then we'll move the camera up, just paint. Get a lot of the yellow. Very speed a bit. Okay. Let's see what we have here. Look at that. Look at that, that's tremendous. Yellow, red, green, blue, all, it's a color palette, it's phenomenal. And then when you process that a little further in, in Photoshop or some kind of serious image editing program, bring out all the texture and details, just, uh, just tremendous. Just a really wonderful color abstract that can now be done on your cell phone. <laughs>the great water lily image you know I like the uh, the subjects great it's like the, the purple and uh, the really vibrant yellow and, and, and the real spiky center it's, it's very graphic very colorful it's kind of a perfect uh, subject for what we're doing here so let's take a uh, straight portrait of this full frame I've got a uh, 300 fixed lens and I'm roughly about six maybe five feet from the subject so it's a big full frame shot so let's have a look and we're right up in there and we'll uh, Take one shot, mirror lock up, and then the final image. We'll have a look at it with, uh, with my hood loop, made by Hood Man, which is great for seeing in back of the finder when it's very, um, very bright to see what you have. And on the uh, more modern cameras, you, you can actually judge sharpness and very critical look at your image with, um, with this. So now there's direct sunlight on the flower which necessitates the use of a diffusion disc. And right here, it's very simple. The sun's right behind me. So if I just hold this diffusion disc up, it creates a shadow, which actually works fine here. Gives you a nice even lighting. So we'll basically uh, take it off mirror lock up because we can't wait. We got to fire it off exactly when it stopped moving. And we're doing that now. It stopped. There's our shot. Do one more. Okay, let's have a look at it. This appears to be right on the money. The whites are good. Histogram says it's good. And we'll keep that. But now in keeping, I like doing more than one shot of each situation if possible. So let's have a look at this in terms of multiple exposure. It's going to be a bit tricky now because um, I just have two hands, you know, and I need those here, but I can actually loosen the collar up on the tripod here on the lens. So I'm doing this. And then if I can just shut the mirror off, we're going to set the multiple exposures up. Do that first. And... We'll go here and then menu, multiple exposure. Okay, and we're good to go. So I'll just get, um, get this set up initially. I'm gonna close this window in the finder because sun will go in there. And if you're on an automatic setting like I am now, it'll underexpose the image dramatically. So you wanna close that window if you have a little gate or hold your hand over it so direct sunlight does not get in there. And I kinda of know where I'm at, so I'll just basically just hand, hold, and turn. Diffuser up with this hand, and I will just go one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Notice I moved back and forth to give a sort of a, an asymmetry. So it isn't quite this boring, mechanistic, consistent movement. You want a little more spontaneity in multiple exposures, a little more unevenness. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. If I would have done this in incremental, going the same direction, it would have been just way too static, way too predictable, way too even. But moving back and forth in different increments. Let me try one more of these because it does, you should shoot several because the movement's always different. You might like some better than others. Shoot three, four, half a dozen maybe of each multiple exposure because it is cheaper than film. Just kidding. Okay, I'll do it by hand, and, and notice that the movements are, are, are not sequential this way, they're rather random. So it's one, 
two, three, four, five, way over here, six, seven, eight, nine, and then 10. So it's a complete, even though you're, you're in the same sphere of, of moving, the increments between exposures changes drastically, and, and, and that will give you a, a more a unique, there we go. Yeah, it, it doesn't look as mechanical as it would be if you turned it sequentially like a gear shift. So changing your movements is critical and shooting several is also critical to get the shot that, uh, that you like. Orchids are, are wonderfully beautiful flowers, very graphic to photograph, but the problem is in orchid rooms, they gotta be kept so hot that everything's very tight. It's hard to get a good background. The flowers are all planted next to the wall and it's just tough to get a very pleasing background, if not impossible. But what Susan has done was she created backgrounds for us by shooting out of focus backdrops. Just look at a colorful scene, defocus a lens, and you get a great background just like that. So we're creating our own out of focus backgrounds to complement these great orchid flowers here, just beautiful. So let's, um, let's get set up and have a look. Susie, so would you mind putting the, yeah, there we go. So she's gonna put that background right behind those two groups of orange flowers that are very beautiful. Look at that. And I have a 200 millimeter lens with, a, with an extension tube on it so I can get a telephoto effect. Gonna wait for it to stop moving. I'm shooting at f14, by the way. Let me go a little more open, f8. Yeah, because they are moving a bit. So we'll do that, and then we'll stop down. And one more all the way down again, because it doesn't matter how much you stop down, the background's still going to be soft. That's the whole idea. So you can get like maximum detail with one of the printed out of focus backgrounds. Just carry it with you, and you're good to go. Uh, and there's a great shot right here next to it, the white one. Sue, so, so could you show the, uh, the other background that we have? We, we have several backgrounds that we printed up. We have two right here. And we're now going to shoot this subject here, these white orchids, with the orange background. Yeah, there we go. While we're in proximity. And let me see. Get right over in here. OK, let me help position this slightly. Susie, we need this to be right up, right up in here. Okay. And I'm going to shoot wide open because I am sort of on a good physical plane right here. Let's get right up here and shoot down a little bit and get the real nice creamy background. So we have the green and all the different tonalities, very nice color, very clean background. And we're shooting fast enough that I should be able to, let's, let's go more wide open. F8. Here we go. Let's see what we have. Beautiful. Tremendous. And that's how you compensate for these very busy backgrounds. That's a pretty cool iPhone shot. And we'll just click right in here to get point of focus and then fire away. Happens in a hurry. Now, we're going to use one of these very cool apps going to um, Low Mob, really cool app. I'm going to pick the shot that I just took right here to my camera roll already. And I click on that and I select the image. It goes into Low Mob. There's a thousand apps. There's a zillion of them. They're all tremendous. Some are better than others. So let's, um, let's have a look at this. Just a quick preview. You're you know, like in and out. You can see it in, in, in a hurry and save it if you like. I'm not a big fan of that. So you click on that and you go back. Look at this one, contact sheet. I like that. Look at the torn edges, you know, and it's sharp enough. Let's get that back, look at that. I'm gonna save it. And if I want, I can go back in and apply some other apps to it to do something else to it. But that's, that's all there is to it. Now Longwood Gardens is a phenomenal place to photograph flowers, but you don't need to go there or places like that to get great flower photography. You can begin on a kitchen table, for example, or like in your own house or almost anywhere. 
And we're going to do that here. We have the, the props that we need to create a uh, great background and, and very razor sharp macro shot. We're going to begin with that. What I want to do is, is show you this very high tech box that we're going to use here. And the really important aspect of this is the printed backgrounds. Susan actually shot these out of focus and uh, these are our printed backgrounds. So you don't need to even find a great background sometimes. Although it's fun and it's, it's, it's tremendous. We're going to set these up right here. And here's our vase, vase. And we'll put our sunflower in here and try to get it propped up a little bit. There we go. Right there. And I'm using a, uh, for this shot, a 200 millimeter macro lens. It's made for shooting at 200 or as a macro lens. Uh, the only difference between this and a uh, telephoto lens is that this can focus extremely close, extremely close. Now we're going to come in here and as with all setup type photography, you need to, to run back and forth and fine tune things and get them exactly where you want. A little clothespin, very high, uh, high end technical device here. And I need it off center just a little bit because I'm going to be shooting the right hand edge of that flower rather than shooting it dead center. And let's see what we're looking at here. Okay. So I've got the center of the flower completely in the frame and way off to the left side. And the other part of the flower has got a nice rolling rhythm to it with a nice pink background. Except the inside of the flower is a bit dark. So I'm going to meter this at about minus two thirds, knowing that when I add reflected light, it's going to be a little bit brighter. It's a reflector. I'm going to grab some window light here and push it back onto the subject just like that. I want to get it as full as I can in there. There we go. Let's see what we have. Got the inside lit up real nice. Oh yeah. Background is like perfectly pink, detailless, and the flower is like razor sharp. Now, the good thing about this technique is that you can actually stop all the way down and the background, since it is out of focus, remains out of focus, you know. Let's uh, try one more shot here. Just one more. While we're here, let's just do one of those there's multiple exposure thingies just moving around slightly. Very easy shot. Set it up uh, in the Nikon camera system, which does multiples in camera. And we're going to do that and that. And we're going to shoot 10, moving randomly, right? So we're going to do like a, a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight nine and ten. That way it's very asymmetrical and doesn't look like it's a machine doing each one. That's very unusual. Very high key background. It's like a, like an exploding sun almost. Very different shot. Histogram reads that it's right on the money, but it's very, uh, very different. I like that. I like the first one also. Let's try to do the back of the flower one time. Let's see what that does. Because while we're here, now we're getting good backlighting over this side, but I might want to add um, the color element at the very top above these, these petals here. So that's a good looking little area right there. And of course, any blemishes can be, uh, can be taken out of there in software. So it isn't that big a deal either way. Just want to grab it right, right in there basically. And again, always compose off tripod. Let's see what we have here. So I'm going to shoot right about here. Okay. How about in a little more? Okay, no need to really get this. You can bring this back actually toward me. There's no need to put it way out there. Okay. And again, it's a bit dark, so we'll use a reflector also on this once I get my composition together. And we got some color in the background. Let's try that. I'm right about here. So you want to approximate where 
the camera's gonna go. So it makes uh, things a bit easier. I think it was somewhere around here, if I'm not mistaken. Right up around here. Okay. And pop that into the quick release plate and square the camera up. There we go. So we're right in here. And we want to get everything, we don't want to clip anything at the edge of the frame. It's going to be tight, but it's going to work out pretty good. What if I uh, turn that slightly this way? And then we have to recompose slightly. Always moving around. Right in there. Just another few inches. There we go. So we have uh, yellow, green, and nice color in the background. And we're at F22, and the left side is a bit dark. So we'll say about minus, again, minus two thirds, knowing that this is an average tonality scene, basically. And I'm going to be increasing exposure by adding reflected light. And we need it right about there. I'm going to grab it out of the window. Right about there, see what that does. Okay. So we brighten that up pretty well. Okay. I'm not a huge fan of that. Let's try something else. Let's get right up in there a little tighter. Again, you can spend as long as you want doing this stuff. It's, uh, it's pretty fun to do in your house. That's for sure. Check the preview button, depth of field preview. If you don't have one, you should, so you can see uh, the sharpness. All lenses meter wide open, and they don't stop down until you press a button. The preview button lets you see it before you shoot it. Let me see, so we're looking at right over here. And let me see, get that really lit up right about in there. Okay, now you can get different size reflectors and diffusers. You just don't need one 40 inches long or 40 inches wide for this shot. So a smaller subject would take a, a smaller diffusion and, and the reflector set. And that's basically uh, the in-home setup or at least one of them. So get started on your own doing this. You don't need to go anywhere. Just get a nice out of focus, shoot your grass out back, get a good soft green background. Store, uh, store bought flowers, a couple of vases, cut them to your, uh, the height that you need, and uh, have at it. Digital infrared is, is, um, is, is pretty hot right now. It's fun stuff, it gives you another whole look of the world. It's pretty amazing. And um, it's important to know that you can't achieve that in software. It's very difficult unless you're a guru to come close to true infrared. But you can get one of your old cameras converted to infrared through several companies that will list at the end of the DVD. A um, few hundred bucks, you have a whole new world to take with you, it's amazing. And this scene here is great for infrared because uh, it's like bright green, bright sunlight uh, is tremendous to bring the, the, the whites. Infrared changes greens. It reads the infrared spectrum, so your greens and your reds turn white. It's tremendous. So we have one here. The shot here is we have the flower and it's circled. There's a circle of these green lily pads that'll be like white and the flower will stand out. It will also be white, but it won't be merged with everything else around it. So it's a nice, everything's very separated, very beautiful. And uh, we'll set a tripod up on this to get the precise composition that we need. It's always a good idea to compose your image off the tripod. That way you're not locked into where the tripod height or whatever. You have more flexibility to move the camera around to get exactly the composition that you want and then move the tripod up to it. That's for, for any kind of photography, not just infrared. So let's find our composition. So we'll come in here, do a little zooming. And that's kind of our shot. So right about here. And a tripod is always a good idea because you can really fine tune your composition and get it exactly, precisely, as you like it. 
And also if you want to shoot more than one picture, so you want to bracket, you have the same shot every time. So tripod use is, is um, I would say essential to successful uh, photography in general. Okay, there's, that's pretty much what we had. And we're cutting off a lot of the uh, lily pads at the edge and the flowers in the middle, but it kind of works in this case. And we'll just go ahead and um, autofocus on the flower and fire that right off. And we'll check our histogram, which you still need in infrared. Got to check that. Okay, the histogram says that we're looking pretty good, but my exposure is a little bit under exposed based on, on a, a color shot. Infrared's much more, you have to fudge a little bit more to get your right exposure. It's always a good idea to bracket with infrared. Take your average shot, go plus one, minus one, but always check your histogram because it's a little more unpredictable than shooting a standard uh, a black and white or, or a color image. Let's take one about plus one and try one more. Yep, right about there is good, right there. You move it up a little bit, recompose, try something different. Always try stuff different. And then we'll autofocus on the flower at f22, infrared, aperture priority, just normal metering, no compensation. Histogram says we are right on the money. Oh, the other thing is with infrared, when you take the shot, it's like real, real sharp. And if anybody ever shot uh, a true infrared film, you want more of a, uh, there's several ways to process it, to, get, to give it that glow, like more of a halo kind of a look, like true infrared. And right out of the camera, you don't quite get that, but with software you do. And, and I'll show you some techniques using Nick software and a uh, digital sandwich technique in Photoshop that will give you that infrared glow. Here's a few processing techniques that I find interesting and helpful in getting the, the images to look the way that I want them to, uh, to look. So let's just uh, get started here. This first um, image was shot, again, at Longwell Gardens in the uh, Lily Pond area. And it's kind of a cool shot. The, the, this dragonfly kind of like hung in there for a while. And I'm using the flower as a background here rather than the prime subject. But it's um, a little bit hot not quite exciting. So earlier in the day, we uh, shot some of these. Early morning, bright sun, backlit, dew drops, got these great specular highlights. Now what's important to realize here is that this color cast will come through on the, um, the dragonfly image and we don't want that. So the first thing is just image, adjust, I always go to straight black and white, no big deal, just at the default. Now, I'll separate these two and I will drag holding down the shift key for proper registration. I will drag the dewdrop image onto the dragonfly image. Now the, 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 the simplest thing is just pull back the opacity and you'll see the, the underlying image come out and a little more color, a little less drama on the uh, dewdrops. There you go. That's not bad. Now we have the, um, the dew drops are sort of in front of everything. And what I want to do is pretty much bring the dragonfly out to give it a uh, sense of depth. I like the big specular highlights, very colorful background. But in this case, we're going to go in here and we're going to create a mask right here. And we'll just select that. Make sure we click on black, which brings out the, uh, the, the dragonfly layer. Select paintbrush, you can use letter B or just click on it. And we'll do a little less than 100% opacity so it looks like it's, like it's real, not too artificial. And then we'll just paint the dragonfly in so it stands out from the, uh, from the background. Right in here. Now I'm not gonna spend a lot of time uh, making this exactly precise because it does take a little bit of time. But this is the idea, and I would of course magnify it to 100% and use a smaller brush to really bring it in where it's perfect. But this gets the point across to you, and you can see what's going on, kind of gives it that nice, this backlit gold is, is translucent, so you don't want to get rid of all this 
even if the dewdrops are behind uh, the dragonfly, you still want to see them through the wings. It, it's the opacity issue here. It, it, they shouldn't be opaque. They are translucent. So we're going to use a less than 100% opacity to, to paint that in. And then we'll just uh, get here as tight as possible. And you see a little bit of a, a, a halo here, just as a quick example. When this is done in real life, I would probably go in here and go to the white layer and then just um, paint the water lily layer back in to get rid of that, uh, that painting out of the box type of look, that halo look. And now we're okay. And we'll put that back to normal size. Let's go back into the black layer and we're going to darken up the bud. because We want all, that also to get rid of this little um, highlight right here. And also of equal importance are the legs. They do have some, some great color in there, you know. So we're going to magnify this and go to a much smaller brush and you'll see. They have some really nice color right in here. See them brighten up? Go to a smaller brush and just bring that in, no problem. And that'll stand out very dramatically. Just fine tune things up in here a little bit. And again, keep changing the brush size. You want to really match this up and not go outside of the... Uh, this is where it's critical to paint inside the lines. See that the, the little, the little halo there? I'll go back in in the final version and really, let's do it now. Let's change by hitting X and go to the white box and we'll paint what we just did out. A little outside the border right there. And that's the idea. So now we have our manufactured uh, dew drops, great background color. The dragonfly stands out, although it's translucent enough to uh, work, and, and, and that's our first example. An often overlooked aspect of flower photography is uh, the backs, which can be very graphic and very beautiful, as in this case. Straight shot at the back of the flower, I couldn't quite get on axis, so it's not quite razor sharp throughout, but uh, it's sharp enough. First off, we're looking at these, uh, these little specks here that we'll get rid of. I'm using the uh, spot healing brush tool very quickly to get rid of these, not cloning. Just very easily getting those out. Now, this to me is a Viveza image. You can do a lot with this with a one plug-in Nix Viveza. So we're going to go up here and we're going to select the plug-in. There it is. Okay, good, here we go. Now, a, a very little known aspect of this particular um, command is structure. And if I pick the green background, because I couldn't quite get it as soft as I wanted, if you select the entire background, the entire green, and then pull the structure completely out of it to zero, Look at that. There's your soft background, just like that. Let me show you again. We'll delete that. That's how it looks. Control point on the green for the entire image, 100%, and then structure all the way back. Very soft background. Everything else is completely unaffected. Good stuff. That's a selective adjustment. If you click on the image and, 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 and collapse these, these uh, adjustments, it changes to global. And we're going to darken the entire image globally. Look at that. Pull it back a notch. There we go. Now we have yellow, we have red, we have green, very profound, very good color. It's sharp enough. But let's pull the structure up in here just a little bit. Bring those veins out a bit. So we're going to select right in here and increase the structure, which has the exact opposite effect. Look at that. Of bringing the detail in. See it? Look at that little 
a little more crisp. And I think we're, we're pretty good right here. Now, I'm going to okay this out. Do I like that? I do like that. We'll okay that out. Good. And then that affects the entire image. So now we're here. There's a very cool uh, company, Alien Skin Software, has some great plugins. Uh, I use Boca and SnapArt a lot. SnapArt is great for this kind of image because it gives, it gives the background a nice texture, you know? So we're going to go in here and we're going to select, well, first of all, uh, Alien Skin, uh, we have to create another layer. So we're going to flatten this and then create another layer to put the, the Alien Skin effect on. So that'll go here. So now we'll say Filter, Alien Skin Snap Art, and I like the oil paint texture. Uh, and pesto is nice, watercolor, my three favorite. Oil paint works well on here. So I'll select that, and then it gives you a default. This is my last, actually not default, this is where I was last time. It brings you back to your, the last setting that you used. But let's look around. All the favorites here are really good. But let's say abstract a small brush, see what that does. See it rendering. And then we'll go to uh, abstract large brush, it's kind of crazy. Not a fan of that, not my particular style. People do like this, by the way. Landscape medium gets more, more realistic. And the portrait one that I use a lot for this particular background effect is, uh, let's try portrait medium brush. Yeah. Because I'm looking at it thinking that I'm going to keep the background like that, but I'm going to paint about half the effect out of the flower to make it, to give it a, a sense of depth. So I'm going to OK that out, and it puts that entire effect on the background copy. Very simply, create a mask, and we'll go to black to paint the effect out of here. Brush tool, there it is. Hit the, uh, the right bracket to increase brush size, and about 67, yeah, I find about two-thirds of the effect is good most of the time. And I'll just paint out roughly uh, one-third of it. You can see it happening over, over here. Get rid of that in the box here. The, the higher the opacity is, the blacker the uh, mask looks. But as of now, at 65%, it's going to look dark gray like that. You can also see uh, how much of the image is covered. So if I stop now, you'll see that I've got some holes in here. And I'll just fill those in. And the other thing imp important to know is that if you lift the brush and set it down again, it gets more dense. So the opacity goes up as you lift the brush each time. So I'm bringing in a little more each time, very graduated, a little bit. Now I want to go to a much smaller brush and then just follow this stem down here. It's also important to realize uh, compositionally that the uh, flower comes, the stem comes out of the corner and brings the flower into the picture space. And I'll dial some of that out here. You can see it. It's kind of going away. The effect is minimized where I'm painting it out. That's the whole point. And let me look at the... Let me get up in here a little bit. And you can tell by looking at the uh, your mask if you missed a spot, basically. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, it's yes, close enough, close enough. So now we're looking at the original. Sorry, no, we're not. We're going to go up here. There's the original, and there's the final. So you have a much more real-looking flower and a very textured, like a textured glass type of uh, marble kind of a background, sort of surrealistic, not real, sort of uh, an interpretation. But again, when you print these out on like a greeting card or a textured paper, it, it, it looks just tremendous. And here's a, another technique that's an overlay type of maneuver, but it uses a script, which gives you a little more control over the layers. 
A script is just a set of, of pre-written instructions that, that, that can do anything. In this case, it gives you more options, it speeds the process up, it gives you more control over the final image. And uh, this particular script is, is called Texture Blending and it's written by uh, Uwe Steinmuller, who's a uh, friend of ours and a uh, photographer in California. Has a website, digitaloutbackphoto.com, and it's available there for like 20 bucks. So it's relatively inexpensive. The key here is to have the image and the texture um, open simultaneously. Only two files, no more than two. And then have the key image showing. Then I'll go to File, I'll go to Script, and I'll go down to Digital Outback Photo, DOP underscore Texture Blending. And now it, it does all this stuff. Just like that. Now that's what it gives you. That's a good jumping off point. Now at this case, in, in this particular spot, it's very simple to, uh, to work with. Here's your layers. It, it gives you all this stuff. And all that I tend to do is go into the levels of each layer and just bring the carrot in to where it reaches the uh, beginning of the, the highlights. And right now we're okay over here and then go to the, the texture, do the exact same thing, but since we're almost there already, I might want to brighten that up a notch, a little bit more over this way. There we go. So now we're looking at, uh, this is very simple to do. We're looking at before, it's got a little more grit, like a print up really nice as a card, but still doesn't have the, uh, yeah, the right stuff for me, because this is where the action is, where the, uh, the uh, stamen are, that's the only place where a color is. It's got a nice warm tonality, but it's just starting to have a warm tonality. So we can go in with Viveza, which is a, a, a Nick product, which I think is a miracle software. It's just amazing what it can do. And I'll select that, and it will open in the, uh, the Nick window. There we go. And in this case, I would probably select the warmth control point right on the warm area, right here. And then make that area where it's going to affect the tonality quite small, so it only affects the warm tonality. And you can adjust those either in the image, where these are very small, or over here, where it says selective. And I can make it a bit warmer. That's kind of the idea. A little more, bring the yellow out a bit. A little more contrast. It's always good to work in small moves. And let's just check the brightness out. A little bit darker, there we go. So now if you hold down the space bar and click on the image, you have before, see that? That little bit of punch? That's critical to me. Those small details, those small improvements can really make, um, make an image work. Um, just move it up a level almost, you know. And there's our beginning, there's our after. So we're gonna okay this out once the, uh, the texture blending has finished its, its work, we're pretty much small little adjustments. There's our final shot. That'll print nice on a greeting card. It's got a nice uh, frame to it, etc. You can shoot these, uh, these textures on your own. You can download them from Flickr. You can buy them. They're everywhere. And texture overlays and blending is, is very, uh, very fun, very in right now. It's, it's, it's the look everybody likes. And a lot of software is being written right now to accommodate the uh, a demand for this sort of technique. So that's uh, texture blending written by uh, available on digitaloutbackphoto.com. I'm going to process an HDR image that we shot. Um, now HDR, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, is a process where where one image cannot capture the entire dynamic range of a scene. So you shoot uh, three or five or more or less to get the dynamic range in a series of exposures that are separated by one stop. In this case, I'm shooting at minus two, one shot at minus one, one shot at average, one shot at plus one, and one shot at plus two. So I've got five images that go from minus two to plus two. In this case, it gets all the highlights and all the shadows for us to work with when we process this image. And as of now, I'm using Photomatix, which is the industry standard as of this time. 
And uh, rather than opening them through photomatics, I find it easier and faster just to drag and drop in the photomatics pro. Let it go, and then you get this window. What do you want to do? I want to generate an HDR image. Fuse exposures is if you do something else, etc. But in general, I use this for generate an HDR image only. And I click that. This just tells me what I have in here. I know what I have in here because I selected them and dragged and dropped them, so that's okay. And we have our generate HDR options window that I keep at these settings all the time. Um, align source images. Every so often, one of the images might be a little out of register, and Photomatix will see that, and then it'll put it back in line again. You can do one of two ways. I would just keep it at the default here. Reduced chromatic aberrations is not a default setting, but I have it on because you get a lot of that chromatic aberration, which is a little red or cyan highlight around an area where a very bright and a very dark areas converge. That line is, gives you chromatic aberration, and Photomatix is very good at controlling that. Noise reduction is not a default setting. I just have it on because it's a very noisy process in Photomatix. And then the recommended uh, tone curve, I just leave that let Photomatix do that. And then we generate our HDR raw file, which is what this is. It won't look like that. It's going to look like what's in this window here. The HDR cannot um, properly display on a monitor like this. This is not a high res enough monitor, so it gives you a small little window so you can see what will happen. And then when I say tone map, you get a series of controls that give you an approximation of where you want to wind up with this. It gives you an idea. Histogram here says that we're okay right now. But not being one to leave things alone, I'm going to click on the default here and see what uh, Photomatix says is natural. Looked better before, but let's just start here. And I will, it needs more saturation, a little more luminosity, a little too much. Just watch your color. You're going to constantly move these sliders back and forth. Um, a little bit flat, uh, which is normal in Photomatix HDR rendering. So we'll push up the contrast a bit. It's called micro contrast, but it's contrast basically. And then I'll click on this light smoothing box because I want to see light mode box because I want to see these rather than the slider. It gives you, you notice how the uh, the the sky gets very dark and patchy. That's a classic HDR mistake. We don't want that. We'll go to high, still kind of there, maximum. I can live with that. The sky is very natural. There's no black splotches like in here or in here. Got to avoid those. So in this case, I go to max. In general, I'm, I'm on the high setting, but in this case, I'm using max. Pull the black point up a little bit so there is some true black in the image. Pull the white point back a little bit look a little more natural, so to speak. Very bleached out sky, very hot, 100 and some degrees. The light, quality of light was not very good, but it gives us a good jumping off point. So we'll uh, process this. Histogram says we're still good. Hit process. And since these are JPEGs, they're gonna process pretty quick. Now we're still in Photomatix, so I'm gonna save this out of Photomatix into um, a specific folder. Put it on the desktop, how about that? And then we'll, um, it's a JPEG. We're going to open it simultaneously. This checkbox, if I just have it off, it'll put it in the folder and it'll go away. If you check open saved image with your chosen application, it'll put it where you want it and open it simultaneously, which saves you one step. So we'll say, yes, yeah, sure, we'll save this. Now it's in the folder and it's open in Photoshop. So we can now quit Photomatic. We're done with that right now. Now we're in Photoshop with the processed image. Now, first thing is to get rid of, of, of little dust specks. So I'll choose and, and use the uh, spot healing brush here to go in and just get these small little dust specks out of here. When you change lenses out in the field a lot, which most people do, it's impossible to avoid dust. Some cameras remove it, like the D3S. If I chose to, it would remove the dust specks. 
but I just did it now here. And now that we're cleaned up, uh, this is a good jump and off point. We're gonna deal with the sky and the contrast issue soon. First thing I'd like to do would be to even out the light down here where the, um, right here, that patchy light, very hard, we had a very hard shadow coming in at that time of day. So again, I'll pick Viveza from Nick and we will select this little dark patch right here and make it just a little bit brighter. So it matches to an extent, that's better already. Do one more time, a little bit brighter. Again, small moves is the way to go with this. Now it tends to, as you brighten, things tend to get a little bit flatter. So you've got to add contrast as you make things brighter. Okay, now if you hold down spacebar and click on the image, before and after. So this works. It's not bad. So we will, um, we'll do one more. We want to bring out this dark area here a bit. So we'll put a control point in here. And again, make that just a, just a hair brighter. You don't want all the shadows to go away but you want to just be able to control them. That's why you want to bring everything in, all your shadows, all your highlights, and you can control the amount of each that you put in your image. It gives you total control over how many shadows, how you control the highlights, etc. So I'll bring this up just a notch right in here. There we go, a little brighter and a little more contrast. There we go. So now we're here and here. Now the next move is going to affect the window. We're going to okay this out and flatten it. I'm satisfied with this. I don't like having a lot of layers open, just personal, personal work style. And now um, I'm going to go into contrast color range, which I use a lot. It's a very powerful, very potent filter in Nick. And you see what it does. Really juices things up, but it also comes in in the yellow part of the spectrum. So all the flowers look washed out. A little known secret, with contrast color range is to move this. If you have any kind of red or amber tonality, move this up. Now it's very red, but it does bring the reds out. These are pink flowers. So we'll back it off just a little bit right here. And that's not bad, but if I do this, see it's crazy. So back around here, and that's got a little more punch. Okay, so now space bar, before and after, okay, this looks pretty good. Maybe a little bit less, there we go. How about that? You gotta play around a little bit with this stuff. There we go. So we'll save that out and we'll do one more maneuver here with Viveza on the sky. This is tremendous. Again, we'll just flatten this out and I'll go back so I wanted to wait and see how color contrast range affected the sky. And I'll go back with Viveza and I'll just target the sky only. Everything else is fine. Target the sky and what's going on outside the window. And we'll just go to bigger controls here. There you go, pull it back a notch. There we go, see that? There we go. A little more life in here now. See that washed out because of the extreme heat. And now we're looking okay. There's still stuff down here that I want to get. So we're gonna, this is also important. We're gonna grab the white clouds right here and increase structure. And that'll add detail in there. See it? Look at that. Much better. And then I want to bring this conservatory dome out just a little bit. So we'll select it. It's all targeted adjustments. That's all it is. You, you got to know what you want. You target it. You do any one of these controls to it. Brighten, contrast, saturation, structure, etc. And we will say, um, we'll increase contrast here a bit. And a little bit darker. All right, now, we're, we're from here to here. Nice sky. The building's a bit got, got more contrast. And one more quick little move. I'm going to bring this in here, bring it back a notch, and then we'll bring that up just a shade. So there's, there's our final shot, you know? 
So after a series of, of targeted adjustments that went by pretty quick, we did a lot there and a couple little maneuvers. Let's have a look at the, um, what we did from beginning to end. Here's our history. It's not a whole lot, but here's the beginning shot. Look at that. It's like a kind of a flat. The, the outside is pretty worthless, really. There's nothing there. And in a matter of a few minutes, we've transformed it in, in, into a, a much more vibrant uh, image, HDR image, with good detail on the inside. Really built, built the outside up quite a bit, so it uh, had nice contrast, had nice color given the very flat day that we had. And, and there's, there's our final shot. There you go. Infrared photography is pretty far out, you know, and um, it's, it's hard to do, if not impossible, to get true infrared in software. You really need to get a, a converted camera, which will shoot pure infrared. And, and what that is, infrared basically is, is uh, it reads infrared spectrum. So you're getting, like, all your greens look white, all your reds look white. They have kind of a glow if you process it right. It's got a really great otherworldly kind of look. And, and there are many infrared conversions that you can get. Color infrared, RGB infrared, etc. What this image is, is an RGB infrared. It's a much larger file size than a black and white infrared. So in this case, it comes out of the camera, out of the software like this. It has sort of a pink cast to it. What I do, since it is kind of a black and white process, is I will open this in NYX Silver Effects Pro and do um, in my conversion there in black and white. There it is. So in this case, um, that's pretty much what it looks like. Now let's mess around a little bit and see what we have. Let's go into green. You have a little more detail. Red's a little bit hot, you know. Push the structure up, see what we get. Now, this, gr this grill here is kind of a problem. It's right underneath the water, but we can actually darken things up a little bit and increase contrast a little bit and make that kind of go away. Pull the structure back a notch, change our color filter, a little darker, there we go. Now, the grid's gone. It's got the infrared glow to it, very white, because these are green lily pads and they look white because of the infrared glow, but when you increase contrast, it gets a bit blocked up. A lot of your subtle detail gets lost. So uh, let me just save this as is. I think we're good here. Let me check the uh, shadow highlights in the software. It says blown out highlights are zero. So I'm gonna save this. It's what we have right now. Next maneuver for me would be to pick Viveza and do a targeted adjustment because we want to come in here and bring more detail out of the center. Because again, the high contrast maneuver to get this look also swallows up your very subtle detail. And we'll just brighten this up a notch and add a little contrast, like a little magic trick. A little more contrast, might be a little hot. Pull it back just a notch. There we go, now we've gone from here. See it, see that? And it puts it back in, so it, it gives you more of what's going on in the center there. So I'm gonna just, that's all that took. I'm gonna get out of here, okay this out. And I like the infrared glow. That's one of my favorite things in infrared. And, and during the film days, you were able to over-process the film and get, an infrared glow, that really neat glow look, which you can do now in software. But the first thing I'll do is clean this up a little bit. I'll take the, uh, the uh, spot healing brush and just uh, get rid of these little marks on the sensor because the D200 does not clean its own sensor. So you've got to go in and when you get uh, a little stuff, you have to go in there and clean that up. No big deal, just small little moves. That's enough. Okay, we're good here. Get rid of that. Now, we'll go back into Nick again. The Glamour Glow Filter is phenomenal for giving the image a really cool glow. Let's do a little more cleaning up. Pick the Clone Tool very quickly. I'm noticing little things now, sorry. Increase the brush size slightly, and then we'll pick black, and we'll just paint that little, little edge out there to clean things up a little bit. 
And if I had more time, I'd go in here and, and get all these edges really, really tightened up. But that's the idea. I'll do something here also, but we'll do that, do that later. Right now, we're gonna go into Glamour Glow and um, give it the infrared glow. It's what we want. Now it comes in real hot, you know, real bright. And I'm gonna say, yeah, sure. Let me just, uh, just okay that out. I'll say, sure, no problem. So now most of the details lost now. So all we have to do at this point, don't forget the very important, let's see what we got here. Yeah, Glamour Glow uh, layer. See if we can pull that back a little bit. There you go. You pull the opacity back slightly to bring that detail in. As you can see, 100%. The glow is like crazy white. You lose some of your detail, but you pull the opacity back in the layers palette, not much. Now we have this going on here, which is pretty cool. There's our infrared. If you hold down option, by the way, a quick little tip and click on the background layer. It's where we started. That's where we ended up. And that's our digital infrared. Here's some images of my um, current flower portfolio that I want to share with you and discuss how they were made. This first image here was shot with a, a tilt shift lens. The flowers are sort of falling back away from the camera and using the tilt shift to bring that in to make them both razor sharp. Um, that's why that lens was used. And also the color combination, the purple yellow is a very appealing uh, color combination to me and uh, filling the frame up as much as possible and using the backdrop from my home studio uh, to, to, to mirror the yellow center of the flowers was how this was how this was made. This was shot in Charleston, South Carolina during a uh, workshop where I decided that I was not going to go out and shoot macro in this particular day. So I go out and I see a great macro shot. So luckily um, I always have a, a small kit of macro uh, material. For example, this was shot with a, uh, with a 70 to 200 millimeter zoom with a uh, 1.7 teleconverter and a 500D diopter, the Canon 500D, which, which limited you know, my physical proximity to the flower, but it gave me the very soft background and enabled me to get a really nice macro shot with minimal uh, macro gear. And uh, it's shot wide open with the primary focus put on the dewdrops specifically. And all the color in this is, is shot from across a body of water, maybe 100 feet away or more. So um, that's the entire color palette and the very soft lines of the flower. Um, it being that out of focus doesn't bother me at all because the sharpness of the dewdrops is, is, is where the attention is uh, uh, drawn to. Okay, this has a, a pretty cool texture put in by uh, an Alien Skin plugin, which I, uh, which I use occasionally, uh, called Impesto. It gives you a very nice textured look. And I painted out that effect on a mask. I just painted the effect out in the very center of the flower. So th those very sh uh, sharp details in the middle are all natural. Everything else in, in the picture has that little Impesto low opacity uh, a texture applied to it. And the background is real. Uh, the, uh, the azalea are, are purple and the yellow is a very bright part of the grass in our backyard. So this is a natural image that's uh, um, uh, dealt with by adding a, a little texture with a, a, a Alien Skin's uh, Snap Art uh, Impasto uh, filter. Okay, shot with a Nikon D3X. Uh, the sharpness is amazing on this. And, and I believe that um, the most powerful black and white images have the most texture, the greatest detail. So I um, just converted this um, to black and white almost when I shot it. This is a great black and white shot. So it was shot in color. And the uh, a color was dialed out of it using uh, Silver Effects Pro from Nick. It can be done many ways. I, I use all Nick stuff, which I love and uh, crop down a little bit to get perfect balance. And the great thing about the D3X or any camera that's a 24 megapixel camera is that you can, you know, the crop factor is pretty amazing. You can crop quite a bit down on your image and, and, and maintain a, a large file size between 40, 50 meg or even more. So that's the big advantage of, uh, 
using a, um, a high megapixel camera, but uh, it's not not inexpensive. Okay, this was shot. This is the, the famous blue poppies that the Longwood Gardens has every every March or April, and that they bring them out. And I mean, I love blue flowers like this. Uh, just tremendous uh, uh, situation and. These were planted in an area where they had yellow flowers in front, like mixing up the colors. And I was able to use a 300 millimeter lens and focus through the yellow foreground flowers to get that little yellow veil at the bottom, which framed the, uh, the uh, center of the, uh, these are called uh, blue poppies. And it's not razor sharp, but uh, it's sharp enough. You've got to shoot wide open to get that very soft foreground flower out of focus. So, and notice all the the, the top uh, right whole right angle edge is is full. There's no holes there. It's a very press up against the frame, which pulls your eye into the picture space a little bit better. Yeah, hey, I love stuff like this. This is a um, some kind of marsh lily. I'm not very good at names, but it's it's. Um, very beautiful and we had very warm light even with a special effect you still need a good quality of light uh, to bring it to life to an extent this had a very warm glow of early morning light on this and i shot a 10 multiple just moving the camera um, not in any kind of pattern per se but just moving it around and you do enough of these and you get a sense of, of pre-visualization how things are going to look and just uh, moving the camera around slightly for each exposure it took about two, two or three shots to get uh, to get what I wanted to see here. Very full frame, fills uh, the entire frame. Nice edge lighting on the shoulder of the petal, and the stamen. The moves are very small, so those little yellow points of the stamen seem to still be very tightly grouped. You know, and it's one of my favorite uh, multiples of the last uh, couple of months. This is a shot in Geneva at a. Um, a uh, lily farm, Geneva, New York. Um, red flowered, really bright red, uh, a lily, and um, a lot of yellow, a lot of green. I look for color uh, a lot. I'm a color photographer primarily. So the more color, the better. And this had a very nice configuration of like green, red, and yellow. The green flower just like stands out against the, uh, I'm sorry, the red flower stands out against the green background there. Uh, because green does recede and red does come out. So they kind of, it forces the red out towards you because it a three dimensionality. And then the yellow just kind of sweeps around as you move the camera, creates this, uh, uh, this sweeping like uh, a hurricane type of, uh, or a nautilus, you know, sort of a swirl by the way you move the camera. And keeping the center of that flower right in the, uh, um, the grid crosshairs in your finder um, kept it looking relatively sharp even though there's 10 exposures going on around that. I kept positioning the center of that flower right in the, the crosshairs in, 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 in the viewfinder to keep it relatively sharp and fill in the frame with color. Okay, texture overlays. Man, do I love texture overlays. Uh, this is um, shot again at Longwood Gardens uh, several years ago and this is uh, a great time to be here is January, February. You get a, like a lot of really thick, hard ice on the windows because it's so humid inside, so cold outside. So you can shoot these great ice textures uh, for, you know, for, for overlay patterns. This is, this is what that is. It's really chunky ice that's used as an overlay over uh, a very pristine uh, orchid. And by adjusting the opacity and messing around with it a bit, you can get the, um, the texture to, to blend with the image. So it looks like it's just one shot rather than two things put together. But the ice is apparent at the very bottom where it's blue. That, that's the window, you know, that you can see that. But the way that it gives the flower a real texture is, uh, I find that a, a very attractive and interesting. Okay, shot recently. This is um, shot in very bright sun, which makes it a very difficult shot to shoot one of. But when you shoot a multiple exposure of it, it tends to to blend and kind of uh, mask that really hot light. And this is a 10 exposure multiple, handheld because it's very bright, just moving the camera somewhat randomly, not really in a strict, a strict pattern. 
to get the, because it's just a shot of color. It's the explosion of the, of the yellow center and the really unusual purple. And uh, the black, of course, is the water that it's uh, sitting in. But in general, just a very easy shot to make if the multiple exposure do it in camera or shoot 10 separate shots and, and blend them in software, which is also very easy to do. But the point here is the color and camera movement to, to really soften the, uh, uh, the harsh light in this uh, situation. Okay, again, shot in extremely hot light, very bright, very hot, 100 degrees, everything's like, you know, very hot. Um, it's a shot at, uh, these, these lily pads are actually very dark burgundy, but um, by overexposing it, in this case about plus one, to really bring it out, it was slightly more overexposed than this, and I dialed it back a little bit during processing to, to show more detail. But it's not silver at all. It's actually dark. It's like burgundy. It's very dark. And by overexposing it, aperture priority plus one, maybe plus one and two-thirds, something like that, you really brighten it up to give it more of a silver look. So I'm kind of adjusting the, the tonality of the subject by, by exposure, you know. And that little center part is like a little patch of water sitting in there, and the green kind of really popped out. It's just a very nice, colorful... To me, a very nice colorful scene and, and being able to make that pad brighter and keep the texture in there was kind of a fun thing to do. So shot recently again. Notice it's, it, it's not quite white. This is a, a color shot that I actually made a duplicate layer and used uh, uh, Alien Skin's uh, Exposure 3 software to um, apply the infrared to one of the, to one of the files. So it's basically one's infrared and one's color, and I just adjusted the opacity so you get sort of a hint of the green and the glow of the infrared in the, uh, the same image. Generally, um, it's almost impossible to get true infrared uh, in software, but every so often it's good enough to, um, to work, to give me the effect that I want. But if I shoot uh, infrared seriously, it's with an infrared camera converted to shoot only pure infrared. Okay, this is pretty cool. This is shot in extremely bright light. Again, over 100 degrees, midday, and a single shot's kind of impossible. It's just forget about it. It's not gonna happen. But, with really deep red flowers like this, by doing some camera movement, it gives the illusion of like some kind of like red, a red acrylic paint almost. It makes it look uh, three-dimensional. And that is the camera movement and the blending of all these exposures during a multiple exposure, which creates that effect. Uh, I will never shoot this as a straight shot in that kind of light ever. It's just too hot, look terrible. But again, moving the camera during the multiple exposure sequence uh, makes the reds again pop out against the green background and looks like an acrylic paint, like, like a crayon almost. Uh, put those red... Uh, the red lines in there. Kind of a cool effect that's, uh, if you know when to shoot it, deep red, especially this time of year at Longwood, there's a lot of deep reds in the outside gardens. And on a bright day, you get this look. It's, it's very easy to achieve. It's got to know where to go when. Okay, again, shot mid-afternoon, so it's still very hot, 100 so degrees again, but the sun's at enough of an angle so I can position myself to get really good backlighting. And this particular subject is, is, is uh, just tremendous for giving it that really great look with, with really harsh backlighting. Doesn't look too hot. The greens look real green. It's got this real ethereal, almost surreal red, pinkish red look to it. And then the repeating flowers in the background. So it creates another layer. So you have this huge foreground section, then a little green layer, and then one more layer in the background. So there's a repetition going on, and there's detail uh, everywhere. So uh, the contrast isn't that as much as I thought it was. There's no real burnt, like black areas, which is high contrast. But um, you got to get out there and try stuff and see what happens. And in this case, uh, it worked out pretty well. Okay, this is um, this is uh, uh, the color has changed on these, which I did in software. But notice how sharp the the, the the, uh, the stamen or the center of the flowers are really sharp in the foreground, like little, like small little, little yellow BBs. It's just amazing. 
and and the uh, the 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 pedals look surreal because what I did is I created another layer in Lucis Pro, and then um, did some smooth I smooth smooth the detail out to give it that that surreal kind of a look. So I painted that in over a mask in Photoshop. Very easy to do. You just create a mask and just paint the effect that you have in Lucis and on the, on, on the pedals, and leaving the yellow unaffected. So you get this this dichotomy of like the, the, it looks real but it kind of looks unreal to an extent and I like stuff that's kind of uh, it's, it's kind of what I call visually ironic you know okay this is um, what I'm doing a lot now these days is, is doing multiple texture overlays where I do like two textures over the image you know and this is an example of that um, the first texture was real subtle like the side of a um, uh, um, a building, but like just real, like you know, slightly detailed uh, uh, um, uh, texture. The other one is much deeper, much uh, more graphic, you know. And and I put those together on this image. You can adjust the opacity of each of those layers and get the perfect blending of each of them. And on this, I did uh, paint the effect out of the flower about 80%. So some of it's there. But that's why the flower stands out against that. If these textures covered the entire image, it would look sort of flat because everything's the exact same thing. But if you paint the effect out of uh, the subject, it'll tend to stand out. And especially a flower as bright as this, it will um, have a three-dimensional, very surreal, artistic, whatever effect as 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 we have here. But I like doing more than one. I'm, I'm, doing more than one texture now on images that I'm using texture overlays on. And this is one of the examples of, uh, of that. Okay, moving the camera, moving. This is, um, what do I call it? I don't even know what I call this. It's basically, I'm, I'm holding the camera and I'm like moving it as I'm twisting the zoom. Holding the camera and like moving it and twisting the zoom. And you get this, this flow of uh, the line, there's no, it's very smooth, it looks like hair, the way, you know, the way you pull the camera around during the zoom. Um, and the exposure's relatively fast, say an eighth or a fifteenth of a second, so you gotta rack it out like in a hurry, kind of this kind of move, like in a big hurry. That way you keep some sharpness where your autofocus is, but you create this, it looks like hair, the way it, it, it just pulls around there. It's just a, it's a fun technique. You got to find the right subject, and it doesn't always work. But when it does, it, it's pretty amazing, and this turned out uh, pretty well. Another lens baby shot. What's what's fun about this is is, is you know, the way it softens the background. You get this very surreal. This is with uh, with a soft focus filter um, and a close up diopter, which will add to the soft feel of the lens. So you would think with the lens baby edge blur that's inherent to it, that it would be enough. But you can add to that as long as something is approaching sharpness here. This is a special effect lens. So you'll, you'll almost never get things razor sharp. That isn't the point. It's about the way it feels to you. And, and um, having the close-up filter and the soft focus filter on the lens gave me this very nice fall off at the bottom and it kind of pulls your eye to the center of the subject but um, in a lens baby kind of way. So it's, uh, it's a fun lens. Now here, um, we're using a, an SB900 Nikon flash, and that has a, a, um, a repeating flash uh, capability. So I can shoot multiple flashes, like strobes. So rather than shooting 10 exposures, like as in a normal multiple exposure, I'm shooting like one exposure with 10 flashes going off. So it's like, it's doing that kind of thing because I'm moving the camera. So I'm getting a multiple exposure based on multiple strobes firing rather than 10 separate exposures. It's a really fun technique and it's just wide open what you can do with it, you know. And again, these are just color abstracts. You see the flower, you can see it, but a lot of color going on around there. And again, if you look closely, you can see where the, the, the flash iterations are. On the right hand side, you can see where the iterations are with each flash going off. It takes some practice, but once they start firing off, they go in a hurry. You can regulate how fast they go, etc. 
but the SB900 is just an amazingly powerful flash. And you can fire off like 20 strobes in like half a second. It's, it's like um, unbelievable. So it's the whole new thing to do and it's just a lot of fun. And, and again, it opens your creativity up to, to new ways to express your, your photography and the way that you feel about it. Just straight camera movement. My good friend William Neal does this a lot. It's basically just, uh, you take about a set, one second exposure and just move the camera. Click, the little like, dr you drag it this way or pull it this way, whatever. And uh, you'll shoot a bunch to get what you want, but it's kind of like getting into a groove. You get about a one second exposure and then move the camera a little bit and look at it. The miracle of digital is you can see what you did immediately. Then you can compensate. So what's happening on this image, after about maybe six or eight or 10 tries, whatever, is I kept the center sharp, but all those petals are, are sort of chewed up. There's some dark parts. It's not a pristine flower. So, but the center was pretty good. So the movement was just to drag it like this way, move the camera this way, click, click. Th just do a few of those to get the movement, click, a little slower. That way it blended, it took all the petals and it blended those together. So it sort of hid everything being chewed up. It just hid those, that, uh, uh, um, the blemishes in the flower, but kept that one little center part relatively sharp. Relatively sharp is the key. It's not about razor sharp. This moving the camera is about an impression. It's not about replication. So it's a different, uh, it's a different point of view for, uh, for sure. Okay, I love this stuff. I love uh, what are called goat's beard. They're like, um, they're like dandelions on steroids. They're huge. And um, this was shot in the Palouse region of Washington State. And we had a sunset. And I always wanted to get a, a fireball behind this flower because it's very translucent, very ethereal. Uh, it's a great subject. These huge seed pods, you know. Um, so I basically picked one. It's a weed and put it where I wanted it to be, which is in my shoe, on the back of my pickup truck, and got down and shot it with a 105 macro, and got the fireball on the other side of the flower, so I was able to shoot wide open with autofocus, the flower's doing this, you know, to wait for it to slow down, and then shot a bunch of these, and got the fireball exactly where I wanted uh, on this shot. It wasn't too bright, got the nice warm tonality, you know it's a fireball back there, and it's great texture going on around it. It's a very, uh, very abstract uh, image that uh, was really fun to make. Okay, another African blue poppy or a Himalayan blue poppy, either one. Uh, just amazing. And again, using Lucis Pro was instrumental in getting this to, to create that shadow around the stamen, to give it that three-dimensionality, which is what's happening here. It looks like it's just three-dimensional, that little pocket that it's sitting in is a function of, um, of what Lucis can do to a subject, create that depth, the three-dimensionality. It's just an amazing software, but again, you have to know how to use it. It's not complicated, you gotta get in there and try it. It's not complicated, but again, it's not, uh, it's not inexpensive. But again, the, the three-dimensionality of this image is, uh, is, is fascinating to me, that you can do that in a two-dimensional space. Texture overlay again, a uh, picture of metal, just blue and uh, et cetera, the green at the bottom, a uh, little vignetting, whatever. But what's important with, with uh, uh, texture overlays is it's got to match the image. That's the key to overlays. It's got to be the right colors. It can either be complementary or, or opposites, whatever it is. Um, red, yellow, green, blue. It's RGB, by the way. I like RGB images that have red, green, and blue in them. I just kind of gravitate toward that. And uh, the flower is being mostly red and the, uh, the green and, and blue texture seemed to work for me. So I overlaid the texture onto the flowers and got uh, this look that I like a lot. Again, shot at uh, Longwood Gardens. Longwood Gardens, again, a very busy scene, very busy. You have these, these wired, these wire grids and like these little, like little flowers in there. So it was a very busy scene, but um, I basically liked it. So I took the shot and uh, took it home and decided that I wanted to pop an overlay on there and, and uh, had to find the right one where it kind of like fell off in the upper right and, and kept part of it sharp. 
and uh, that's what I think worked. Those little little ice crystals that are breaking up in the in the right side of the frame. That's part of the overlay. That kind of pulls your eye. If you look at this closely, it's like half warm and half cool. The sharp part of the image on the right hand side is in the warm part of the image. The left hand side is more cool, more blue shifted. So uh, it was kind of pick the texture that matched that. So your eye would go, it would see the, the part that was cool, but would move to the part that was warm. That's the whole idea. That's your, that's your job as a photographer is to lead the viewer through your picture space by the use of color, composition, line, etc. And that's what seems to, seems to apply here, so. Okay, shot with my good buddy, Brenda Tharp, when she was in town. We spent a lot of time messing around with this shot, again at Longwood Gardens. Uh, red poppy and the uh, nice blue flowers around there. So we just did a, uh, just a swipe, circular swipe. I auto-focused on the very center of that flower and did about a one second exposure. Just did a bunch of them. Different rates of movement, real fast, real slow, etc. Because I wanted to keep some detail on the flower, but I wanted a very smooth and totally defocused background. And that does take some experimentation um, with different rates of speed. And I found one um, that gave me what I liked, and that's what this one is here. Picture of movement, basically. On the same day, um, okay flower. The, you know, the color was okay. What I thought was nice was the texture. Um, okay flower. The, you know, the color was okay. What I thought was nice was the texture. Um, and the fact that it's not chewed up at all. It's a perfect subject, but the center is like so sharp. And again, with the, uh, the Nikon D3X, which is 24.5 megapixel camera, you're able to get this incredible detail on stuff like this. Um, just amazing. Again, shot with the D3X. And um, compositionally, what's important, it, it, you, how do you fit a subject that's so unwieldy in a picture space? You, you chop off, left-hand side is chopped off, the bottom is like chopped off. But if you look at the right, the top and the right sides, the petals are fully included. So the moral is that it's okay to really chop your subject off, but not to clip the very tips of the flower. Imagine the right hand side, if the edge just touched that little petal, it, it would be, um, it wouldn't work. You gotta leave space, but when you wanna chop things off, just cut them off radically, and it works, it just works. Another pristine subject. This is like the pollen is still there. It's just perfect. This lasts about less than a day. So if you see this stuff, don't wait. Shoot it immediately. Um, just sharp enough. And, and again, what kills me on this is that all the pollen is still on there. The bees haven't gotten in to, to harvest that yet. So I got there before they did. And again, full frame, getting the, the center off center a bit and showing the full petals on the left side for balance, the way it would the flow, the image flow from right to left. Really fun shot, good color. Okay, again, this is one of those, uh, I need a name for it, where I'm like zooming while I'm moving the camera. Just, I'm pulling the camera this way and I'm zooming. Moving the camera and zooming simultaneously. Um, and you gotta shoot a bunch, you get a feel for what you want and then you'll start honing in to get the look. What I wanted was just an impression of these flowers that you see in the middle there and a complete explosion of color going on around it. And that's a function of how fast you zoom, how fast you move the camera, what your shutter speed is. All these things are variables that you distill down to what works by shooting a bunch of them. Then looking at it, evaluating what you did, and then fine tune any one of those aforementioned variables to get what you want. It's a process. It's not just one shot unless you're lucky. It's a process. Okay, texture overlay with a lens baby fisheye lens. I mean, why not? You know, it's all there. Um, and again, the, uh, bl the black background is, is, is put in. There's a lot of bleed with the fisheye. And I like the, the outside to be black most of the time. So I just select the subject, the orb, and then invert the selection do a little feathering and just paint it black. It's a piece of cake, easy to do. 
and all the color inside, this is a green subject, all the color inside is again a texture overlay that has some blue, some cool color in it, which I thought worked with the, uh, the inherent green uh, tonality of the subject, so something to do, it's fun stuff. High key subject, this is very, very bright, you know, uh, more of a high key, w which I like on this kind of very ethereal, uh, translucent type of subject. Um, again, shot at Longwood, lens baby shot, by the way, and shot wide open, no aperture, and just focusing right on those lines on the flower to get uh, just enough sharp that you can see what's happening. So I like this, uh, the feel of this image. Very bright, very high key type of shot. Okay, camera movement. You can move up, down, sideways, or in a circle like this. That's what this is. I'm moving the camera. Again, this is shot in North Carolina in, in uh, 103 degree. I, you know, I do not shoot in that kind of heat all the time. <laughs> shot in 103 degree heat, and I'm moving the camera like this, because a straight shot was, was impossible. It was too bright, too hot, the light was hot, didn't look good, but again, when you move the camera around, um, you, you soften all that, you soften that effect. And that's what's happening here. Hand holding, just click, doing like a semicircle, moving in. Not that way, but moving in a three-dimensional plane. Shoot and move in, in and around. And that's why that has that, that uh, 3D look to it. 10 multiple, no problem. Uh, auto focusing on the middle. Just moving the camera around a circle. Straight circle for 10 exposures. Easy shot in the world. Got to find the right subject. The technique is quite simple. And again, you can do multiples in camera or in software. If you do it in software, you've got to shoot 10 properly exposed images or whatever you want. Three, four, six, whatever. All properly exposed and then you blend them with a, a certain formula in software. Not that difficult. Okay, this, this was an interesting lesson for us during our workshop on Whidbey Island. This is a shot at a, a garden store, good one. Really nice outdoor shop. A lot of flowers, multiple exposure shot with a um, 70 to 200 millimeter zoom lens, but I'm actually auto-focusing in the middle, which I almost never do. But if you do that and then shoot, zoom, turn, shoot, zoom, turn 10 times, you get this spiral effect, which is very fun. Now that's, this is a shot in very subdued light, even, everything's very even. Went back later the same day and um, it was very bright, very hot, bright sun. And we almost didn't shoot it at all. But I said, you know what? You never know until you try it. So now it's a very high contrast shot. There are some black areas and some slightly blown out areas, but the effect is radically different. And the texture of this image, because of the high contrast, is remarkable. There's a previous, very subtle, very soft. All the lines are very muted. Then again, with the very bright, harsh contrast, you get this. They're both very workable. They're both printable. And just a very different look at the exact same location shot in, in very different qualities of light. Okay, lens baby, uh, fish eye. What I love is, is with, with the fish eye, you can actually move it to almost touch the subject, almost touch it. And that's what this is. Any kind of round flower is just a great subject for the fish eye. It just like, you just, it just fills that frame perfectly, you know. And the background color complements the blue warm, cool juxtaposition, but uh, very fun shot. Again, the, the background is black because I, I don't like the bleed that you get. Works sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. But this is actually Magnolia Garden, South Carolina. Just phenomenal place. We had a great spring. This stuff was everywhere. And uh, the azaleas, all over the place. Just beautiful. And, um, you know, again, just uh, just using the flowers to to give a sense of place and whatever. And the basic feel here was a very soft feel. It's very muted light, overcast, whatever. And I added a uh, soft filter, a Singray uh, soft ray filter to this 
to give it kind of a softer look, more of a, it made the bridge glow a little bit, the flowers glow a little bit more. It, it made it feel more like it felt to me being there physically. So uh, just slightly altered with a, a soft focus filter. So this is a, a digital sandwich. Anybody who shot slide sandwiches knows the look. This is the look. You can do it digitally also. And that's, uh, that's what this is. One shot is, is, is sharp, one's defocused, and they're blended using the, uh, the, the, uh, um, in the blending drop-down, the multiply in the blending drop-down, basically, to get this look. It's, it's a pretty true slide sandwich look. Okay, shot with a, um, again, very clean. I like soft backgrounds. It, it, that's where it's at for me. Very soft backgrounds. This is an image overlay. You see the, the, the small halo around the stem, especially? That's the out of focus part of that image. They're both shot wide open because I want the background to be soft for both images. So the first one is shot wide open, looks normal, background's very soft. The other one is, is shot wide open and defocused. So the background remains soft, but the defocus gives it more of a, a halo. So there's no need, normally people would shoot one stopped all the way down and one opened up and defocused and you get this nice halo look and you get this sharpness, which is okay too. But to have the background completely soft, both images you need to shoot both of them wide open and defocus the second and that's, that's what happened here. Interesting shot with a, a Canon G10 out of my car somewhere in California at a stoplight. Uh, just amazing what these cameras can do. Point and shoot camera. Uh, they're very sophisticated. And it converted to black and white in Nick Silver Effects Pro. Looks like a, a large format picture almost. But it's shot with a uh, point and shoot camera out of the window. So it's, uh, it's amazing. But that's, uh, that's what we have there. It's kind of a quick grab shot. Okay, again, I love these flowers. But what's cool about this is I use a, a filter called Topaz Adjust to give it more of a uh, slightly over the top, slightly uh, details pulled out, kind of a much more colorful than it was in real life kind of a shot. But also the background is what's critical. All those little specular highlights in there are um, hot spots of leaves, like little hot spots. But again, when they're out of focus, if you shot this stopped all the way down, you'd see like, you know, real, the leaves are all like, you know, too hot. They have hot spots. It's terrible. But when you shoot wide open and focus in front of those very bright highlights, they take on the shape of the lens diaphragm. I see a little bit of edges on, the, on those highlights. So my guess is this is shot at about F8. It's got a little diaphragm shape to it. That's how you know. But that's how you create those specular highlights. Okay, it's always a good idea to shoot on ground level with your subject. Flower, kid, animal, you name it. Get down where it or they are to get this kind of perspective. So I'm right down there on the ground pointing in to a huge patch of these tulips, again at Longwood Gardens, and trying to find a um, shot in, pretty much in, in March, April, and they have this huge area of purple flowers then, which I love. And um, on the other side of this patch of tulips were a patch of purple flowers. I wanted to somehow use that to frame one of these flowers. That was the whole point. So I started shooting this with, the, uh, with that in mind. So I'm just focusing through with a 300 millimeter lens, focusing through all these flowers, moving the camera around to get what I wanted, which is a little bit of purple to, 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 you know, to frame one flower and I managed to, to find one. It's not razor sharp because it is shot wide open to get everything soft around it, but it is uh, sharp enough to get the point across. This is uh, pretty cool. This was uh, shot in our home studio and um, stopped all the way down, F22. But notice that only the one flower is sharp and none of the background flowers are all out of focus. And they're very close together. It's only a few inches between the one that's sharp and the ones that aren't. And Nikon had this, uh, they still use this in their point of purchase displays at like Photo Expo and that kind of thing. The reason that the background flowers aren't sharp even though it stopped all the way down 
is a piece of textured glass between the foreground flower right in between so it's a matter of inches where the, the glass is between the prime subject and the background flower. It's consequently, no matter how far I stop down, the background flowers aren't going to be sharp because they can't be. The te textured glass, has, it's not going to be sharp, but it will make the foreground flower sharp. So it's one way to really create selective focus um, in this kind of situation. Textured glass is uh, a really fun thing to mess around with. A uh, shot at Longwood. These were gone the next day, by the way. It's like John Shaw says, shoot it when you see it. Just shoot it when you see it. We shot a bunch of these, shot with the uh, tilt shift lens. That's why it's like razor sharp. Because the flower was kind of at an angle. I'm, I'm pointing this way. And, and these were not quite on the same plane. They could have, they, we couldn't get to it that way. But a tilt shift lens actually raised that front element up so it was on the same plane as a subject and I was able to get this thing razor sharp and I wanted more the next day drove an hour and a half to get here and uh, they dug them up they were gone replaced so again shoot it when you see it okay this shot was um, shot in a friend of mine's garden I, yeah I love these flowers you saw one earlier this is a little more advanced stage of, of, of blooming um, what we have here is a 10 multiple exposure. You see how small the increments are. If you look at the, uh, the bottom right especially, there's 10 little hooks if you count them. That's how small the moves are in multiple exposures that I do in general. Keep it very, very tight. Um, so you can kind of tell what it is. And then I ran this through Lucis Pro. Actually, that's not quite true. I did the first part as a multiple, then I blended it with the original to put more detail in. So it's a multiple and a straight shot blended together with an opacity adjusted to get the look. Then I ran that final image in the Lucis Pro to get this uh, uh, somewhat surreal image. You know, I mean, it is what it looked like, but the, a little over the top, which you can do with Lucis, it's an amazing program. But that's what that is. One straight multiple blended with the original straight shot and then run through Lucis Pro to get this uh, somewhat surreal look. Shot on our kitchen table, basically. Uh, this is what we use on a Nikon calendar. Um, it's all about quality of light, folks. It's not where you go, it's not when you go. It's a matter of just knowing get the quality of light. That can be anywhere. And uh, on this day, it was on our kitchen table. Natural light, natural window light, 105 macro, stopped all the way down to get things as sharp as possible, especially in the middle. With roses, you want that the tightest fold to be sharp in the middle. And um, that's pretty much what we have. Very simple window shot, stop down, get in the center, get into the very tight part of that bud in the bottom, off-center portion of the frame, so it kind of has this movement where it moves into the picture space, so it pulls your eye. And again, this has been used by Nikon many times. Calendar, point of purchase, etc. Very simple. Very simple image. This was shot several years ago when I first got my 300 millimeter lens and I realized that I could shoot within four feet of a subject and, and get the great flower shots that I've seen other people do. In this case, the, uh, the, the, it's shooting through a couple of gardens. The, the yellow tulip patch was in front of me, but about 50 feet away was a red tulip patch. And that was used as the background and just shot wide open very selective focus. Nothing is sharp at the very top of that green stamen that was composed actually to place the green right inside of the reddest part of the image to create that really strong color contrast. Everything looks fine but your eye goes right to that spot because it's, it's, it's like involuntary. It's human nature to be gravitated and pulled to that, that color combination or those kind of things. Uh, yellow and blue red and green. These are very strong color contrasts and they pull the viewer. You can use that to your advantage to pull the viewer into your picture space. Uh, shot wide open again, completely blurred but that, except for that one little spot. And that's one of my favorite flower shots uh, ever. Just worked out really well the day I was there. And that pretty much concludes the, uh, the festivities here. This is uh, a lot of, of different techniques and ideas that I try to mess around with and keep trying to evolve 
and just keep trying new stuff, you know, and, and don't, don't remain static. These are things that I, things are important to me and techniques that I use over and over again in various ways to try to keep things um, fresh for me. Mastering photography takes persistence and practice. Stay with it and look forward to future installments from the Photomasters edition of the Ultimate Photo Guide Digital Photography Series.